So I'm gonna wait another 30 seconds or so um, as people are joining us. Um, so I think people may still filter in, but I want to welcome you to this um, third summer craft lesson lunch this summer hosted by the first year writing program at Eugene Lang. Um, I'm Miller Oberman, the new director of first year writing at Lang, and I'm joined today by Jessica Gross, who's one of our fabulous faculty members, um, as well as an alum right? Um, Jessica has an MFA from the new school. And we are going to be talking about sound and music in writing today. Um, maybe I'll say a few more things about you, Jessica, if, if, if it doesn't make you too embarrassed. Um, well, it make me really embarrassed, but it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jessica has an MFA from the new school and has published articles and criticism and short stories widely, including places like the LA Times Book Review. Is that right? It's uh, the Los Angeles Review of Books. LA it's Review of Books. And yeah. the New York Times Magazine and Paris Review. Um, and most importantly, Jessica has a new book out, a first novel. Congratulations. Thank um, you. It's called Hysteria, which is an amazing title. Um, where can we get that if we wanted it? So it's, it's, uh, the pub date is August 18th. So it's less than a month till it will be released, but you can pre-order it at your local bookstore is probably the best place. Excellent. Yeah. Um, or bookshop I've been using a lot, yeah. which is pretty nice. Same. Very good. Very good place to order books. Yeah. Which also supports local bookstores. Yeah. Um, so... We will be back. We have two more of these. Um, one, the next one is going to be on August 4th in two weeks. I will be here to introduce A.W. Strauss, um, who I'm not going to be in conversation with, but who will give a lecture on um, a public space is his topic. So um, come back for that. Um, and let's begin. Yeah. So, um, Jessica and I spoke last week and just started chatting about sound um, in writing, which I think as a, for me as a poet is something that poets talk about obsessively. Um, and I think gets talked about less in terms of prose and even less in terms of essay writing. Um, but it's something I always try to talk to my students about because I think it's incredibly important. Um, you can write, you can have the most interesting idea in the world, but if it doesn't sound good, it gets boring to read about it. Um, and I, I really believe that. So what, what we're going to do, I think, is talk about a few different passages of writing that we're interested in, in the sound work that's happening, the music that's being made. Um, and so we're going to read a few things and talk about them back and forth. And um, Jessica has chosen a couple, I chose one. And then Jessica is going to read one passage from her new novel um, that we're going to talk about, which has interesting sound. Um, and then finally, we'll take some questions. And so um, what seems to work the best in this format um, is if you have questions, just hang on to them, write them down, and we'll, we'll get to them at the end. So any, anything that comes up, just remember it and note it to yourself. Um, so should we start with one of the passages or do you want to say anything about sound before or do you want to just jump right in? I think let's jump right in. I think we right. can do it by example. Um, yeah. So the, I'll, I'll share the screen in a second to um, show you my very low tech word document in which I have compiled the passages. Um, but the first one I chose I actually talked about it in a craft lunch two years ago because I love it so much. And it's a passage from Charlotte's Web. I think that children's books often use sound really beautifully because the part of the intent is to kind of feel like a lullaby. So when it's done really well in a book like Charlotte's Web, it 
it can, it can really feel that way. So, all right, I'll share the screen and I'll just um, read this quote aloud and then we'll talk about it. So maybe for the people uh, in the audience, you can kind of just see how it feels to be read to. Um, maybe close your eyes if you feel like that, if you enjoy doing that kind of thing and, and see how this, like what, what the music feels like to you to hear. All right. The next day it was rainy and dark. Rain fell on the roof of the barn and dripped steadily from the eaves. Rain fell in the barnyard and ran in crooked courses down into the lane where thistles and pigweed grew. Rain spattered against Mrs. Zuckerman's kitchen windows and came gushing out of the downspouts. Rain fell on the backs of the sheep as they grazed in the meadow. When the sheep tired of standing in the rain, they walked slowly up the lane and into the fold. So there's so much I love about this quote that it's hard to know where to start. I mean, there's certain obvious things about it, the repetition of rain at the beginning of each of these sentences. Um, but there's something that Miller and I were talking about when we spoke last week that's kind of a feeling of, like the way the poem feels in the body to read. And so Miller, I'm gonna be curious here. I'll come out of the screen share now. Um, but I'm curious, uh, to hear how it felt to be read to. But for me, there's certain things I notice reading aloud that I don't even notice as much when I read the poem to myself in my head, or sorry, the, it's funny, I said poem. It's not a poem, but it feels that way to me. Um, there's this line that I love rhythmically, that it feels like the something about the entire passage is guiding me to put emphasis in, on certain words in a way that creates a kind of musical rhythm. Rain spattered against Mrs. Zuckerman's kitchen windows. It's like, I can't help almost like nodding along as I read um, that sentence that it's, it's kind of guiding me to a certain beat. Um, so yeah, I'm curious, maybe you can talk a little bit about what it was like to, to hear that read to you. Um. It, for me, that passage is so relaxing. Mm -hmm. Like, it feels like I almost get a sense of relief from it. Um, it's so easy to listen to and to read. And one of the things that I notice in the sound is that there's a lot of sort of internal assonance. It's not just the repetition of rain, but it's all of these vowels. It's a really vowel heavy um, passage and it, so it just there's this like open feeling and this movement of the rain coming down um and I just feel like I'm it's washing over me yeah. um and it's I was thinking about the word eaves which I love it's such a beautiful specific word but I also sometimes when I hear words I hear uh, they remind me of other words and then I get a kind of like second tone um if we're thinking about music, I get a sort of second tone. And when I think, when I hear eaves, I also hear ease. And so I was like, I feel at ease in this passage. I feel comfortable. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, my favorite word in this passage is fold, which is the last word. And it's striking me as you're talking that there's not a lot of percussive sounds here. A lot of the, the letters have, are soft. So, that also is, kind of, it feels like it's simulating the, the sound of like, yeah, the, the kind of hum of rain coming down. Um, maybe I'll just share it one more time so you can. Yeah. Actually, when you took it down, I missed it. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Gushing out of the downspouts downspout is such a there's such good sound to that it feels like it's coming it's flowing down yeah and what was the other assonance that that 
kind of stuck out to you? Remember you oh, you talked about dark and barn. Yeah, dark and barn, kitchen and window. Um, mm -hmm. these, these kinds of assonance in the middle of a word, um, internal rhyme like that, for me, it just makes things feel connected. Mm -hmm. um, it's this, it's this kind of connect, unseen or less seen, less flashy connectedness. Yeah. You can also, you can um, like imagine the sentence is re rewritten to be more efficient and the rhythm kind of falls away. So if it was rain fell on the sheep's backs as they grazed in the meadow, it has an entirely different rhythm than rain fell on the backs of the sheep as they grazed in the meadow. Obviously, it's, in, it's intentional, but it's not so showy that we know it, we, we feel like we're being manipulated. Um, it feels so, so natural. The it's way taking that its time, completely taking its time. Yeah. And, you know, even though we, we promised that we weren't going to talk about the, the novel Charlotte's Web as a whole, and I haven't read it since I was a child, but I do remember that there's a pig and a kid and a spider and like spiders weave webs and connect things and that this book is about sort of like interspecies and human animal communication and connectedness and it seems to me like no accident that this kind of a passage where it just feels like everything is touching each other and connected in this lovely way mm -hmm. um, that we would get that kind of a sound effect in that novel yeah Totally. I love that point. Oh, and there was something else you said the other time we spoke. You were talking about the feeling, uh, the feeling in the body. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about how you talk about that in terms of writing and reading poetry. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think when we're reading something on the page, like the sound that it makes and the way that it can look on the page are the sort of physical reminders that we're not just reading, it's not just a brain activity, but it's a body, body activity. And in poetry, of course, you get to take up space physically on the page in different ways and sort of make a body. But in prose, that's not happening as much. And so you really just have, um, you have the sound going on to get you in your body. And I think whether you're aware of it or not, the sound that the words make inhabit you physically. Um, and that's the way to get your reader connected and to sort of reach them um, is through sound. Yeah. Actually, we were going to go to the update quote next, but maybe we'll go to the other one that I, I was thinking the same thing. Because, so I'll just um, scroll down to it. So thinking about how you, your body feels um, when you're reading different Things, different rhythms. Um, okay, you know what? I won't preamble. I actually will just be curious to uh, for people to experience this quotation. So people who've been my students before, you might have read this because I've taught it a few times because I love this story. This is from a Simone de Beauvoir short story called Monologue, which is a, a long rant, essentially, um, by a middle-aged woman. And you don't really know exactly what she's ranting about, really, until late in the story. Okay. Wind. It suddenly started to blow like fury, how I should like an enormous disaster that would sweep everything away and me with it, a typhoon, a cyclone, it would be restful to die if there were no one left to think about me, give up my poor body, my poor little life to them, no. But for everybody to plunge into nothingness, that would be fine. I'm tired of fighting them. Even when I'm alone, they carry me. It's exhausting. I wish it would all come to an end. Alas, I shan't have my typhoon. I never have anything I want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. It's so great. So um, one time, a student of mine who had read this story said that reading it gave her a literal headache, and she had to step away from the story halfway through to come back and read it again. So obviously, I was reading that much faster than I read the Charlotte's Web quote. Um, but the text was making me kind of do that, because there are no punctuate or not no punctuation, but there's very limited punctuation. Things run together. Um, there's a lot of exclamation points. 
uh, I, we're being kind of guided to gallop along at the pace of this kind of frantic, hysterical mind, um, which I love. So this isn't beautiful in the way that Charlotte's Web is beautiful. Like it's not relaxing to be in the presence of, at least in my experience, maybe someone finds this relaxing, um, like a New York City jackhammer or something like that. Um, but it's so, there's a, such a bodily experience reading this aloud, hearing it, but even just like reading it to yourself in your mind. It feel, it's like hard not to feel like tense and almost like the hairs stand up on your arms uh, at the kind of ferocity of the pacing here. But is that your experience? A hundred percent. This is so great. I love, I love what she's doing here with the punctuation. And if we're talking about music, punctuation is so important in terms of rhythm. And it tells us, um, you know, like a musical signature would tell us, like, this is what time you're in. Um, this, is, this is how to think about this. And having these exclamations and these, like we get these tiny one word sort of like, ah, and then the rest of it are these long sentences where you don't even get to take a break, like breath with these colons where there's like things inside of things. Um, it's, it's, real, it's almost like the colons are the opposite of parentheses when I'm looking at them. Like if a parentheses is, if a parents, is that, how would I say if one, if a parenthetical statement is like sort of an internal aside, the way that she's using colon here feels like the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. like, like things keep just like rushing through, rushing through, rushing through without stopping. Yeah. It, they almost look like I'm looking at them and I'm thinking about a gate. Like I'm just going to open this floodgate and there's another thing. <laughs> but totally. a couple would indicate that you should take a breath and she doesn't want that. Yeah, right. And what's coming after isn't exactly modifying what's coming before in the way that colons are typically used. It's just like, no, more. You're going to hear more. And what I think is so great, what I, I mean, it's hard not to laugh at the end. And I think yeah. the reason that it's, I mean, it feels like a child having a temper tantrum, right? Just like screaming, screaming, screaming. But you don't sort of realize it until this absolutely ridiculous statement at the end. I shan't have my typhoon. I never have anything I want, like a hissy fit about there not being a destructive weather pattern. Um, but because you've been set up to think that this is a tantrum the whole way through, when it's actually, you know, made explicit at the end, the joke lands and it's really funny. And the first wind. <laughs> yeah. You can picture her like stomping her foot, you know? But I get this feeling, like I, I know this feeling so well in my body when I'm reading this fast thing, that feeling when you're having a really bad day and maybe a bad week and maybe like a bad life in some way and you're like, men are horrible, right? And I'm living in this oppressive condition all the time. And at last there's gonna be like a big freaking storm and you think there's gonna be one and then it just fizzles out. Yeah, totally. And you don't get that release from it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe that's why it's like headache inducing too, because it's a little too familiar. It's like there's something repulsive about it in its uh, familiarity too. We yeah. all know the kind of thought patterns. Um, you're like, oh God, oh God, I know this too well. Totally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That feeling of like when you just want the weather to like mimic how you feel inside on this grand scale. Yeah. And I think she's evoking that weather with the uncontrollable sort of rhythm of it. Yeah. Right. I've, never get... seen it, I've never seen anyone use colons like this before. Yeah. Right. I'm not, I'm not sure it's like right. Technically, yeah, I yeah. don't think <laughs> I don't think this is how, hey kids, don't ever use colons like this. <laughs> but nothing, in terms of the punctuation, nothing is really yeah. right. Um, but I think that's well, like, um, yeah. I often say to my students, um, 
And I see that there are even maybe a few of them here who have heard me say this, but like, for me, punctuation is completely emotional. Like, I just feel that there should be a comma here. I kind of feel in a semicolon here. I, I know that that's wrong, but I've gotten pretty far doing that. I do it the exact same way. I mean, I was really horrible at learning grammar. I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, but it's worked out totally fine. Um, I've definitely gone about punctuation in a totally musical rhythmic sense. I think grammar is here for us, right? Like we're not here to serve grammar. <laughs> like it's here to serve our purposes of yeah. expression. Yeah, right. And that's what she's doing here. Yeah, yes. But she has to. She has to be so familiar with the work, the the normal workings of grammar, in order to wield the disruption of that normalcy so effectively here. I mm. think. Cool. Now I'm like, so one thing that Jessica and I were talking about when we spoke last week was that we both discovered that sometimes we get irritated by when we think writers are noodling, um, which is the word that I use when I hear some bro um, like playing guitar riffs on the boardwalk and just showing off, but alone, not really making music with anyone, um, just trying to like show off virtuosically. Um, and we were talking about how writers do that. And we, we picked a, pa well, Jessica picked a pa passage. And now I'm wondering, like, do we do it last or do we do it now? Let's do it now. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do the honor of reading it or do you want me to read it? Um, you should read it. Okay. So, yeah, I'm going to read this and then we'll talk about what we think is a ostentate, like pointlessly ostentatious or show offy about it without trying to be too cruel but we, we I guess to, to preface it this is a passage from John Updike's very famous novel Rabbit Run so we think it's fair to punch up in this way in a way that we <laughs> wouldn't do <laughs> to say one of our um, peers and friends uh, so all right boys are, this is a very open this is the first paragraph of this novel okay Boys are playing basketball around a telephone pole with a backboard bolted to it. Legs, shouts. The scrape and snap of kids on loose alley pebbles seems to catapult their voices high into the moist March air blue above the wires. Rabbit Angstrom coming up the alley in a business suit stops and watches though he's 26 and 6'3". So tall, he seems an unlikely rabbit, but the breath of white face, the pallor of his blue irises, and a nervous flutter under his brief nose <laughs> as he stabs a cigarette into his mouth partially explain the nickname, which was given to him when he, too, was a boy. Um, yeah, maybe you can start us off here. <laughs> um, for one thing, like, I definitely read this passage, and I think this person is a good writer. Like this is competent in every way. Um, and I think not knowing that it was written by one of the very few people to have ever won two Pulitzer Prizes for literature, like you would know that this person is trained and practiced in their craft. So I, I will certainly give him that. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of um, virtuosic flourishes here. Um, there's a lot of consonants, boys, basketball, scrape and snap and moist and march and there's like a lot of sort of little fireworks going off but it feels very empty to me and that was sort of our definition does it feel like what's what's the purpose of it um or is it just like it's gonna look good yeah yeah there's something that feels deeply alienating about it um like Right, like the performance is the point, rather than in the case of the example that we just looked at, the Simone de Beauvoir example, the point isn't to look at the author and say, wow, like you did such a good job. It's to be totally embedded in the psyche of this narrator. And here I feel as though we're supposedly being led to be really moved by him seeing a, like a child at one point in his past. Um, but I kind of, 
I reach the end of that and I think, okay, I actually don't care about this person for any reason other than seeing the, I guess, surprising descriptor brief appended to his nose instead of small. Um, this just hasn't made me like invest in this character at all yet. Um, so yeah, I think my favorite part in terms of, um, <laughs> my favorite part in terms of mockable things is probably legs shouts, which feels like a totally uh, unhelpful addition to the passage that's kind of showing off the ability to write a really short sentence fragment, but without any of the attention paid to like actually choosing specifics that would evoke an image in the reader's mind. Um, yeah. I actually get very little physicality from it too. Like reading this doesn't give me an embodied feeling. Yeah. Um, and I think something like legs, shouts, the way that these are just parts, like a part of sound, a part of a body, um, I feel sort of separate. I feel like I'm floating above my body when I read this. It doesn't, um, it doesn't put me there. It's, yeah. Yeah, right. These like, el these bodily elements are being picked apart without actually like, simulating the, what it's like to be a person, <laughs> an actual holistic yeah. human being, right? Yeah. We, we get legs, we get shouts, we get kids, we get, uh, like, irises, a nose, a mouth. It's very interesting, but there isn't really a sense of like humanity. Yeah. And I think like, as I pointed out before, like I don't need the alley pebbles. I don't need to be told that they're loose. Like they're alley pebbles. Like they're not gonna be cement, like bolted to the ground, <laughs> you know? And it's weird because I, I like, I know exactly what it feels like to play basketball in a like, alley or a driveway and the way that gravel moves under your feet but like that's not even a that's not evoked here yeah and what do you think mean, maybe this is too hard a question to answer on the spot but what do you think would have successfully evoked that as a counter proposal to what's being done here i can't answer this on the spot so if you can that's totally fine. i don't think i can but I, but i feel like um I guess what I feel like is that what you said before is really important to me. I think what's happening is that this character is being introduced to us. Um, and we're, I think that the invitation to, um, to feeling in this passage is that this character was once a boy and here are some boys. And it's playing on like an entire assumed wealth of emotions around boyhood and masculinity of a certain kind. Um, that I personally don't share. And if if I don't share them, um, then I don't really have a way in because it's asking for me to do a lot of work um, and and to connect to, I think, probably what the the writer assumes is like a universal human experience, but which is not a universal human experience. Yeah. Um, and so that's where I think you're right that when he too was a boy, it's supposed to make me is supposed to like make me feel a bunch of stuff and think of a bunch of stuff and it doesn't. Yeah, right. And the thing is, even if you do share that experience, you don't go to literature to be told to just like pull upon your own experience to fill in the gaps. You go to literature to like create a new experience of your past for you. I don't know if that makes sense, but at least that's how I read. Even if yeah. some, uh, like the feeling of going to like, a passage explaining something that is true to you, about you, um, in a way that you have never, that's, it hasn't been crystallized in your mind before, is very different than it just like signifying stuff you're supposed to like know about from your experience on your own. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, and, and I, sh I should have said at the beginning, like I admittedly have not read this whole novel. I did try and I like, I just tossed it down. Um, it didn't, it didn't grip me. I understand apparently it gripped many. <laughs> I, I did read the whole thing, but I can't say that there's anything that has stayed in my mind, unfortunately. This is for, it was mandatory book club assignment for about 10 years ago, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Um, 
but all right. Should we move on to your yeah. song choice? Yes. Um, this poem is, um, this is a sonnet uh, by Terence Hayes, the master sonneter, um, sonneteer. Um, and this is from his book of the same name, Wind in a Box. And this is the first poem in the book, which I think is important to say because it's a brilliant first poem. Um, and I'll read it. Wind in a Box. This ink, this name, this blood, this blunder, this blood, this loss, this lonesome wind, this canyon, this twin swiftly paddling, shadow blooming an inch above the carpet, this cry, this mud, this shudder, this is where I stood, by the bed, by the door, by the window, in the night, in the night. How deep, how often must a woman be touched? How deep, how often have I been touched? On the bone, on the shoulder, on the brow, on the knuckle. Touch like a last name, touch like a wet match, touch like an empty shoe and an empty shoe, sweet and incomprehensible. This ink, this name, this blood and wonder, this box, this body in a box, this blood in the body, this wind in the blood. I'm, I'm, I've been obsessed with this poem for like five years. Uh, I'll say a few things and then I'm really interested to know like what you um, noticed. Um, I, I think of this poem for one thing as kind of a meditation on a single sound, um, that gut uh sound, blood, blunder, it's mud, uh, touch, it's so knuckle. I mean, it's endless. Um, and so, whereas in a sonnet, you expect this rhyme scheme in a Shakespearean sonnet you won in, um, this poem, in a, at the end of a Shakespearean sonnet, you know, you have A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, those are the rhymes, G, G at the end. So the last two lines, you get this satisfying, um, couplet with this rhyme at the end. And Hayes, like, I want to say one ups it, but he sort of a thousand ups it. We get the, not only do we get the double rhyme of blood and blood, but we get a triple, we get triple blood at the end, um, which I find just astonishing the way, the way that it moves and the way that it puts me in my body and it puts the body in a box, right, at the end. Um, the box, the box, the form of the sonnet, right? And the box, the body that houses whatever we are other than the body. And then, of course, I think about a coffin um, and kind of like a final box. Um, and it all is moving to the same place and, um, and also asking us to think about touch itself. Um, how we've been touched and how we've touched others. Yeah, that's so beautifully said. I've never read this poem until you sent it to me. I guess I'll say in case anyone watching feels this way too, I really love poetry, but I feel always embarrassed to kind of talk about it analytically. Um, so I'll do my best, but it's uh, not the form I'm most familiar with analyzing, especially publicly. But I guess what I, um, the thing that stands out to me most just technically is the boldness of, I mean, he has the line breaks that he knows he has to abide by in this poem, but the boldness of kind of like inserting line, basically what are breaks into the line itself um, feels sort of similar to the way that Simone de Beauvoir is playing with punctuation. It's like, mm -hmm. no, I know what I'm supposed to be doing here, but I'm actually going to like disrupt what's expected in this form to use it to my own ends. 
Um, so he, like inducing the stuttering rhythm here, I love. And then this, I mean, I was curious to hear your thoughts on this unusual punctuation that I've never seen before, this M dash followed by a period, this kind of like, for, it's like this forced um, longer pause than you could probably induce in any other way. It's like a rush to pause. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it, but what do you think of this punctuation? Um, yeah, I mean, the way that he's using punctuation in here is fascinating yeah. in every instance. When I see an M dash before a period, I think something's not being said. Um, things being left out. Um, and I also just see this visually, like he's talking about a shadow an inch above the carpet. And so it's like I'm literally seeing something there. Hmm. Um, and I guess I'm seeing a body um, or a part of a body, um, which a shadow indicates, right? But I'm also just seeing something, something unsaid. Mm. I love that. And all of this like repetition in the poem too. That's the other thing that he does like so masterfully here. He starts, he builds up these rhythms and he gets you right into it and then he breaks it. And then he makes another kind of rhythm and then he breaks it and he goes back to another one. I mean, these short sentences, this ink, this name, and then how deep, how often. It, there's all of these things that kind of mirror each other. Um, and it's so, uh, the precision and the way that he uses punctuation for, for rhythm, I think, is so musical. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. you. I was gonna say, especially with those, those slashes, this twin, swiftly pedaling you have you have to slow down yeah yeah i was also i mean you you mentioned the repetition of blood 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 i mean the uh, the word that's repeated probably most here is this and it's just such a i mean as mu as much as the rain in the charlotte's web quote was like repeated to induce this kind of relaxed feeling of rushing water, then this feels like a much more insistent, almost pounding, like pay it, like, it's like, yeah, there's an, ins there's a, an insistence on like a demand almost. It feels like a demand to like pay attention. I don't know how else to say it. Um, not, we're not being invited to be like lulled to sleep here, it's like wake up and kind of that, that kind of fits with exactly what you were saying about the kind of shifts in rhythm. We're not trying to be relaxed into just like a sonolescent state. It's like, no, <laughs> come back, like wake up again. Um, yeah. <laughs> so great. Yeah, I, I, one of the places in here where I think is the, is possibly the sort of biggest um, sound and rhythm shift is right before the turn back to blood at the end, S sweet and incomprehensible. Mm. I mean, that's like a five syllable word all of a sudden in this poem where every, almost every word before feels like a, a punch in the gut or in the face, like wake up this thing, this thing. And then all of a sudden, sweet and incomprehensible. Right. And it, it's like, it brings me back to that wind, right? This like wind that's rushing through or trapped in this box. Um, and in a way, I think all of that intensity maybe kind of whirls around the acknowledgement or that nod to the like unknown in that moment. Great. Yeah. <laughs> really great. How did you find this? Like, how did you come across this? Just by buying the book and reading it? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of his work. And um, 
this, like, I highly recommend this book. He has, he has another book entirely of sonnets as well. Um, but this book is not. And I just, this was the first poem in the book. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, like as a first poem, it's just like, how are you not going to read every single word that comes after this? Right. Yeah. Should we, will you read to us a passage from, from your book? I will. I, uh, so. Your book available for pre-order? Yeah. Uh, and I'll show it to you just because I, so this is not the, the, I don't have the final copy, but this is the, um, galley so like the advanced copy and I just I'm like endlessly grateful for the cover design which I had absolutely nothing to do with they stop saying yes that's perfect so there it is um so anyway but I I typed up um a passage from it that comes early in the book doesn't require any um contextual knowledge so I'll just I'll read I'll read it and then we can talk about it uh Oh, the character's hungover. I think that will become apparent. All right. One good thing about a bad hangover, like having the flu, is the immediacy. There's little room for preoccupation with what transpired last night or what's going to happen tonight or next month or next year. All that dissolves in the face of the pleasurable hum of pain, that low-grade nausea blooming like algae in the gut, the cotton ache in the skull. Soft bird chirps are piercing, the sun slices right through the brain. Each car horn is an assault. The rest is for later. Unfortunately, my hangover wasn't that bad. Though, so, um, what I was telling Miller before we spoke, uh, started this was that, um, so this, I, when this paragraph came out, I was really happy uh, in the way that you kind of very rarely, but once in a while get to be when you're writing sort of surprises you and you don't necessarily have like totally conscious control over what's emerged. Um, you know, obviously I like tinkered and played with it a lot in the revision process, but the, the kind of bones of trying to induce the fuzzy feeling, not just through the images that I was offering, but through the rhythm of the language itself, trying to like induce the, it's not, it's not like the lullaby feeling of Charlotte's Web, but there's something, um, I was trying to get at this kind of like gauzy haze that you can feel when you drank too much the night before. Now, when I was uh, editing the book with my agent, I suddenly realized that this character actually, what she's claiming is that she can't be thinking in an obsessional way because she's hungover. But then she goes on to like perseverate um, kind of frantically for the entire rest of the book. So I thought, oh shit, do I have to like delete this paragraph now that I really like? And I guess according to the Kill Your Darlings philosophy, the answer is yes, I should have, but I decided not to do that and instead the workaround that I found was um, was this line. Unfortunately, my hangover wasn't that bad, <laughs> which when I came up with it really made me laugh also. Um, rhythmically, I guess it, since we're talking about the music of the language, uh, it kind of like punctures the whatever that gauzy thing is that I was trying to simulate in the paragraph before. It's like, well, yeah, but that's not what's happening here. Um, so yeah, that's it that. Made me, it made me laugh out loud when I read it. I was like, oh no. <laughs> like, because the idea that you're wishing, the character's wishing for a hangover that would be worse is very funny yeah. um, and sad. Or but sad. I think, but I think it made me laugh because of how engaged I was in the writing before that. Um, I think blooming like algae in the gut um, and that whole description, the, the hum of pain, the cotton ache, cotton ache skull, those things are like really, the sound is really working there to um, go, go with the meaning of it. Cool. And I think that maybe another part that I really loved was this image of the sun slicing right through the brain. And I think in terms of physicality, it's funny because 
um, although I was saying that Updike didn't need the word loose, um, I think you really need the word right there because I think it's working in a double way. I think it's working um, saying like right through, like all the way through, but it's also a directional word. And so I'm seeing this right word slice and it's really making me sort of, it, it's very physical to see this, this flashing blinding slice that feels like it has this diagonal because of that work. And it's mm -hmm. quite, it feels much more embodied that's so interesting. And I mean, this is obviously not intentional consciously because it's just occurring to me as uh, we're talking about it. But I think in a way that word kind of gets at the, the wish of the characters that's embedded there, which is that this hangover would slice through her overactive kind of beast of a mind so that she wouldn't have to deal with it anymore. That would be the, the right thing to happen would be for, to be able to surrender to the the pain, the like obliterating pain of, of a hangover rather than the thoughts that are kind of haunting her. Yeah. That, that's really, really interesting. And I think like this sort of goes to, we briefly talked about this last week, but like in terms of working on sound in your writing, um, for me, I said, that's really not something I think about very much while I'm writing. It's something I think about in revision. Um, and some great sound happens accidentally, but I think for me, it's one of those things that if you're trying too hard to do it, um, that's when I'm probably gonna not be able to write anything at all. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of about noticing what you have going on and then how can you enhance that um, or add to it. Yeah, I work the same way. Here, I'll come out of the screen share now. Um, but I think, I mean, we were talking about how much fun we both find revision because that's when you actually get to, I mean, especially, well, it's probably true in, in nonfiction and fiction writing, but it's like getting out the substance of what you're trying to say is so onerous that I always find, at least for me, like kind of getting through a first draft of something, actually just getting on the page what I mean to convey is, is like, yeah, it feels sort of like tugging rocks or something like that up the, down a street or whatever. Then when I get to go back and, and tinker, right, that's the fun because I don't, like I know what I'm trying to say. Now I can like, like do the slight alterations to language that um, exactly like you said, sort of actually, it's like the hard work of the, the thinking is done. And now it's more of the, I don't know, I guess what you would call like, it feels, it feels like more of an art to me. Yeah, and I think because especially when you, when you first get out the thing that you're trying to express, what you think, what you feel, you're getting like a piece of it. But that's only a part of writing because that's only a part of experience, right? Like we experience the world in all of these ways through all of these senses. It's never just like what someone says to you. It's the way that they say it. It's the way that the light looks when they say it. It's like all of these things um, are part of it. It's whether you're hungover or not. It's what happened five minutes before, right? Like so much goes into how we experience moments in our lives. And so the idea that you could get all of that out the first time, it doesn't make any sense. Like it's all so layered. And what is can be really fun about writing is that when you slow down enough to like you get out the first part and then you're like filling in all of these layers. Um, through these other craft sort of things, things, that's a useful word. Um, but like through working with sound, through how can I make a more perfect image? Is that the exact right word? Um, all of that stuff, for me, that also is where the most fun of writing is. Um, yeah. Getting away from the idea that you have to express it exactly right the first time. You're not going to. Yeah, right. And if you did, it would, it would like, remove the possibility of that incredibly satisfying feeling when things actually click into place. There's the like agitation of like, wait, this isn't quite it. And it's almost like an itchy feeling. And then you make a tiny change, you reorder something a little bit, or you substitute a word and it just, you're like, it, it's like relief. It's like, oh yes, <laughs> that is it. That's yeah. it. Itchy is such a good description of that feeling. 
Yeah, because I think it is like a, doing a puzzle a little bit. Yeah. I think that maybe the most important thing that we can do as teachers of writing is to like tell people and convince people if they need to be convinced that like it's not about making a mistake or not making a mistake, right? Like I feel so often like people are really apologetic when I'm like, well, what about fiddling with this section? And they're like, oh, I'm sorry. That was just like my first, I was really tired when I, I'm like, what you know it's not you didn't do anything wrong it just takes more time and that's what's fun about it yes but i we're like taught that it's supposed to come out as this perfected thing yeah that seems like a, a kind of deep cultural problem that goes way beyond writing that you're supposed to know everything immediately before you even learn it <laughs> so yes. you're correct about that yeah. um we have like nine minutes. So if people do want to ask us any questions, um, feel free to put them in the Q&A thing. I do not see any right now. Um, I have seen some chat suggestions like about other takedowns of John Updike, which I haven't read, but I'm very excited to. Um, <laughs> but if people want to ask us anything, you can do that now. Otherwise, we will just keep noodling ourselves yeah. um <laughs> i think the day that i that i like had the worst experience of noodling was with this bro um on the on the brighton beach boardwalk when i used to live there who was noodling on a base <laughs> and i was like why are you doing this on a base like this is not this is not for public entertainment in any way like i can't really experience like these electric bass riffs <laughs> that are the same thing over and over like this is not pleasurable for me <laughs> all the same i kind of want to hear it now <laughs> so bad yeah here you have plugged yourself into an amplifier <laughs> under my window yeah oh the other thing that we were thinking of bringing up was um just the role that that reading aloud plays in our own writing process mm -hmm. and it's something that, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of resistance to. Um, I, we're, you know, among students, but also just like ourselves, people, our friends and stuff like that. I mean, there's something deeply, that can be deeply awkward about reading, definitely reading aloud when there's another person in a room reading your work aloud to yourself. Um, but even just having to kind of be your own witness to your read aloud. But um, I think as maybe, our reading of these passages aloud suggests there's probably no better way to kind of get a sense of the rhythm that you're creating. Um, so, yeah. Especially, yeah, I mean, especially for anyone who does struggle with punctuation, um, like I often say, just read it out loud and put, put punctuation mark everywhere where you want to pause or take a breath, see how you're actually reading it. Um, first. And that's something that I think can be really useful because some, like a lot of people don't learn how to do grammar stuff and punctuation stuff from technical instruction and books. And I think some people who were taught that way, it just doesn't penetrate at all yeah. because you don't learn that way. And like, I don't learn that way and I don't retain any of that. And so I have to find other ways to try to figure it out. Um, yeah but mostly those ways aren't given to us. Um, I'm, look, I'm looking at a question from Alyssa. Um, how does sound function in my translation work? How do you preserve the meaning while also offering language that sounds pleasant or interesting? Um, well, I would just say in translation, and um, for anyone who's working on translation, you know that there's two kinds of problems, right? One is when something sounds amazing and you can't get it to sound that amazing in your language that you're translating into, and that's really frustrating. Um, I just do my best. And sometimes I'll try to add, if I really notice a loss in one area, I'll try to gain that sound back somewhere else. Um, but mostly I try to stay as sort of true as I can to the original text. And if it doesn't sound beautiful, I'm not gonna try to make it sound beautiful too. I think um, just trying to be honest about what's there. Um, do we have suggestions for unnoodling writing? 
What do you have an answer? Do you? I mean, what comes to mind, I think getting back to what we were talking about with um, the updike. Yeah. Well, there's no like wholesale uh, rule I can say for when it is, does feel like that and not. And obviously plenty of people read that book and didn't experience it that way. Sure. But I guess from my perspective, like kind of maybe doing an, a read through of the piece where your only question that you're looking for is what is the purpose of the <laughs> what I'm doing here? Is the purpose only to impress people? If so, I, I think this is a part that needs to be reworked. Like that, that might be my best strategy is just like actually trying to dig into the intention that's underlying yeah. uh, choices that you've made. If it's like, if, the, if it's serving some broader purpose of peace or if it's just serving like writerly ego. Am I just trying to show off? Yeah. Yeah. Or is it some, is there something else going on? Yeah, I think that's a really good, or, and I would also say, read something aloud and ask yourself, how does it sound to me? How does it feel in my body to read this? Um, have someone else read to you and see, do, are they struggling? You know, are, are they like falling all over themselves because it's too complicated to read? Um, yeah, I mean, I think like affect can be really interesting um, sometimes we have almost not talked about music, but sometimes I like to listen to Glenn Gould, um, the classical pianist when I'm writing. Um, I rarely listen to music, but for some reason Glenn Gould like helps me. And you know, he hums <laughs> and you can hear him humming a little bit in the old recordings under the music. And it's so weird. Um, and in some of them, they like edit it out. And I think it's one of those things for me where it's like that sound underneath is interesting to me because he's not thinking about it. You know that he's not, he's just that in that. He's just in it that much and he can't help but also vocalize it. Um, and it just is, he's not showing off, right? Yeah, although I mean the, the interesting thing is that it is ultimately just like everything else. It's so subjective because yeah. I could probably picked a Nabokov passage as an example of noodling, but I love Nabokov and the noodling works for me for some reason. It's like, if he's showing off, that's fine. I think he's doing it really well. It, it works for me. So yeah, I guess, you know, the classic advice to take all of this with, with the grain of salt that, you know, it, ultimately what, what works and for one person might be noodling for another person, so. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. I think, and I would just say one way to really think about working on this and we're basically out of time, but in, in um, your own writing is just to pay more careful attention to sound when you read. Um, and to think about writing about sound when you write and when you're writing about texts, like look at that. Um, I said on the phone last week, I was like, if you have any problem meeting length ever, writing about something like how sentences sound and what the rhythm is like, it, it offers you this huge amount of subtext under the text, which you can bring to the surface as text. Um, and I think paying, paying more attention to those rhythms in other writing, it will kind of start to bleed into your own in ways. I yeah. Think. <laughs> yeah, but I don't recommend necessarily thinking about it like I'm going to write something and it's going to sound really great. For yeah. me, that would be a recipe for disaster. Yeah, I agree. Um, this has been a delight, Jessica, Same. to talk. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I can't wait to read your book. And um, thank you everyone so much for being with us for lunch. Um, lunch where we don't eat um, was maybe some of you got to eat. <laughs> next week, maybe I'll bring a sandwich next time. Um, come back in two weeks. We will be here um, on the 4th with A.W. Strauss for a public space. 
Um, so I hope to see some of you then. And in the meantime, um, thank you so much for coming and um, see you soon. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks, Miller. Thank you.